Hope you're having a good day today. Um, we are going to get into the topic of brakes, clutches, and uh, frictional elements. I've, I may have titled this uh, a little bit too expansively if you're expecting to get all of that out of today's lecture. Uh, so that's kind of where I want to start with it is there is a lot of stuff in this chapter that has to do with clutches and, and um, you know, things like cone clutches and disc clutches and that kind of thing. Um, what I decided to do as far as what I will present today is what I think is one of the more difficult uh, items that is in the chapter. Uh, disc clutches aren't really that hard to deal with relatively because they, uh, you know, they have simple geometry with respect to how the force is applied to the frictional elements in a disc clutch. And so it's a, it's a relatively straightforward calculation to figure out how much torque they can carry and that kind of thing. Um, one item that is a little bit harder to deal with in this chapter is the topic of drum brakes. And the reason drum brakes are a little bit harder to deal with is due to one of the uh, characteristics that they've got that can be used to your advantage. And that characteristic is something that the book refers to as self-energization -energi or self-de-energization. And here's kind of what that means. Um, as your drum, so the way a drum brake works is that there is a uh, cylindrical piece that has a surface on the inside of the cylinder that is designed to carry uh, you know, some sort of a frictional force on that inside uh, surface. As a matter of fact, I've got a picture of what this looks like in actual practice up here. So you see that there's this thing, they call it the brake cylinder. Sometimes that's referred to as a slave cylinder because uh, it is being uh, activated by another cylinder that's often called the master cylinder. So there's a place where the hydraulic pressure originates and it goes to uh, the wheel cylinders or, or brake cylinders, uh, those are all sort of synonymous terms. But anyway, that pressure goes into the cylinder and then pushes these pistons. There's a piston that pushes this way, and there's another piston here that pushes this way inside of that single uh, cylinder right there. And it does that due to uh, brake fluid pressure. As it does that, it pushes these shoes uh, into the inside surface of the drum. And uh, you might even notice, I found this picture online, you might even notice that the one that's labeled the primary shoe, and there's one here that's labeled a secondary shoe. The reason for that is that there is a particular direction that this, this uh, drum is turning, okay? This is a, uh, you're kind of looking from the side of the vehicle at a rear wheel here, and this rear wheel is made to turn in that direction. So that's as it's turning that direction, um, then you, you might want to stop the vehicle, and so you might want to apply friction to the inside surface of the drum and stop the vehicle. Um, but you might see here also that as you do that, the tendency of the drum to want to turn this way will also try to make this shoe go that way. And what happens is because there's a, a location where the shoe uh, kind of effectively has a pivot point, where the shoe touches this stop on this one side, then what happens is the, the energy of braking actually pulls the shoe harder into the drum, all right? And it actually uses the energy that it's dissipating to apply this frictional force in order to make the vehicle stop. And uh, these types of brakes were really common on uh, many vehicles. A lot of times for all four wheels, uh, they're really common on vehicles uh, up to the point where uh, automotive manufacturers figure out, figured out better ways to provide energy for braking, doing it through things like brake boosters, uh, which use, you know, some of them use vacuum boosters. It uses vacuum from your engine to actually boost your brake uh, effort that you put on your pedal, thereby being able to apply more pressure into your uh, brake actuation um, mechanisms. But anyway, and with the, with the advent of that, it's made uh, disc brakes a lot more popular. And the reason why disc brakes are popular is actually exactly the same reason um, as why these were popular, but in reverse. So the, the disadvantage of, brake, uh, of drum brakes is that self-energization. They are um, a little bit 
uh, less responsive as far as exactly what kind of braking you want. It's harder to get it with a drum brake because it's using energy from stopping the car to, to slow the car down. And so they, you might uh, think of this as they can feel a little bit grabby, right? When you, when you push your brakes on, you might start getting more braking than you really wanted, right? Because of this effect. So anyway, figured I'd talk about this a little bit. Uh, on the left here, you see an up cl a closer up picture of what a uh, wheel cylinder, brake cylinder, or slave cylinder, all those are kind of uh, synonymous terms with respect to this, what that looks like. You basically have a place where fluid pressure is introduced in here. This right here is uh, where you can bleed your brakes, which is a place where you can take air out of the system. And then you have the two pistons. This is a piston that would come out this way, and this is another piston that would go out that way whenever you apply that brake fluid pressure. Uh, one last thing I'll mention with respect to drum brakes here is that there's a second mechanism that may kind of go uh, without a whole lot of notice unless I pointed it out. Um, vehicles are actually required to have a secondary braking system that is outside of the uh, hydraulic braking system that's the primary braking system. You all are familiar with this. You call it your emergency brake. There's a cable that comes in through this tube right here and that cable comes up in here and pulls on that lever. And that lever basically swivels, you know, probably up here somewhere. And as that lever swivels, it pushes on this rod and it provides another way of pushing that primary shoe into the drum, okay? Come back to this idea of the primary shoe. The primary shoe is the one that receives that self-energization um, benefit, but that also means we have this secondary shoe which is not receiving that self-energization. As a matter of fact, it self-de-energizes. So what we mean by that is that there's actually this uh, effect due to the rotation of this thing. There's an effect that tends to um, kind of make your effort less effective with respect to that back shoe. On net though, the, uh, the benefit, there is benefit to having this self-energization due to what happens on the front shoe, even though it makes the rear shoe there a little bit less effective. Um, so I just kind of wanted to talk through some of this as far as how it really looks. What we're going to do is uh, analyze a brake drum that's built in a similar way to the one that I just showed you there and try to figure out if we want 300 foot pounds of braking torque, uh, then how much uh, force does the wheel cylinder or the brake cylinder there how much force does it need to apply to the shoes up there at the top? And I've given a few dimensions and such uh, that occur on this shoe. All right. So here's kind of the tricky part. There's, there's kind of a few tricky parts, but let me start with the, the big concept. Okay. The big concept here is that we can figure out an amount of torque contributed by each shoe because each shoe is not going to contribute the same amount of torque. But what can we say about the sum of the two torques that the shoes contribute? Okay, let's call them T1 for shoe one. That's the torque, the braking torque that's being contributed by shoe number one. T2 will be the braking uh, torque contributed by shoe number two. And these have got to sum to 300 foot pounds if that's how much braking torque we want to make sure that we can apply, okay? Well, T1 and T2 are not uh, equal to each other, and that's kind of the trickiest part of this problem. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a fast way to get to a conclusion as to, uh, you know, what to do about this. So I'm gonna try to help us get through that concept here uh, relatively quickly. Where we see T showing up uh, in the book is with equation 16.6, okay? So let me write this up here, equation 16.6. Equation 16.6 says that T is equal to the integral of, lowercase f here is the friction coefficient that we have for the, the uh, material pair between the drum and the shoe, okay? R 
is just the radius uh, of the drum. And I think that is up here somewhere. Yeah, so this, you might see this right here. This is the radius. I'll try to make some of these values, uh, those variables a little bit larger on this figure to help us know what they mean. Then we have um, dn, okay? Well, what is that? All right, well, that's kind of referring to a, uh, a normal force, but it's referring to a differential amount of normal force that's happening at, happening at any location along the brake chute. Fortunately, it gives us a little bit more help and says, hey, you can compute this by using an expression of friction factor, which is assumed to be constant, times, okay, P sub A is the maximum pressure that is experienced within the um, within the the friction interface between the shoe and the drum. Okay, uh, B, which is just the depth of the shoe in and out of the page. So that was what we set up here was one inch. Uh, R squared. Okay, which we already referred to R earlier, over sine of what they call theta a, okay? Uh, theta a is essentially where the amount of pressure in the shoe peaks out. So this kind of requires a little bit of uh, discussion. Um, there will be, whenever you set up a drum brake like this, there will be a uh, sinusoidally shaped pressure distribution across the face where the pressure is applied, all right? And they give that uh, a picture of how that distribution will occur with figure 16.6, if you want to refer to it. And they, they mention on there that the point where the distribution of pressure goes the highest is at this angle of theta A. Okay? This is also where they discuss short shoes versus long shoes. Uh, the difference between short shoes and long shoes are does the shoe include the peak point of the sine curve or not? All right, if it's a short shoe, sometimes it will not include the peak point of the sine curve. Fortunately, we are uh, dealing with a long shoe here, and so that makes this a little bit more simple to deal with, but uh, just go ahead and make mention of that. All right, and this is all going to get multiplied by an integral from uh, theta one to theta two of sine theta d theta. Okay. And so what I want to show you with that equation is that all of these variables are written with respect to the figure that's given here. And I know the figure is a little bit, might be a little bit hard for you to see, so let me make these a little bit bigger. The angle from where the pin is located, so this is kind of our zero angle, is to where this pin is located. Let me make that a different color, okay? So we start with a zero uh, theta angle right there, and all of our thetas then are measured with respect to that line where the pin is located. And so any, gen you know, any general theta is given with uh, this line right up here, okay? And so that's why they show theta for that angle right there, okay? Um, theta one and theta two show you the limits of where the shoe actually exists, right? So it kind of tells you where does the shoe start and where does the shoe stop with respect to where there is breaking material, okay? And so uh, this one right here is where the shoe starts, and so that's why this angle right here is theta one. Okay, and then there's another angle that goes up here, and that angle, you might see it right here, is theta two. Okay, so that was a bunch of stuff. Um, how does it apply to us? Okay, 
Let me do this. This uh, equation that I just wrote is true for both shoes, and, and it gives you the amount of torque for a shoe, right? It, you might see the picture only has one shoe in it, right? So this is the amount of torque given by one shoe. If we can figure out a ratio between my two torques, between my two shoes, that'll help us establish what each of the torques must be. And then from there, maybe we can get to uh, a statement about the amount of force, okay? So what does that look like? What if I took this expression and I basically said this was T1, all right? Which things in the expression change once I put that subscript of one on there? Does the friction factor change? Okay, friction factor doesn't change. The, does the pressure, does the maximum pressure change? Okay, this one's probably the trickiest. Um, because there is this effect of either energization because of the direction of rotation or de-energization, that piece of A does not remain the same for the two shoes. So what we would need to do here is put a little subscript on there. This is the maximum pressure we achieve in shoe one. Okay. What about B? Does B change? Okay, no, B is going to be the same for the two of them. R, does it change? Nope. Okay, sine theta A. I mentioned this earlier. Sine theta A, I may as well talk about this right now. On page 826, it gives you the direction that basically says, as long as you have a long shoe, meaning it's, it's one that contains wherever the, the uh, natural uh, maximum value is in the sinusoidal curve, right? If you have enough shoe such that it contains that point, then the value of theta A is just 90 degrees, okay? So theta A for us equals 90 degrees because we have a long shoe, okay? Um, and because theta A is equal to 90, what is sine of 90 degrees? One. So that one kind of goes away anyway, because we're dealing with long shoes. Okay, now what about my integral from theta one to theta two of sine theta d theta? Okay. Do my theta limits change? Because that's the only thing that would change on an expression like that, because theta here is just a, what we call a dummy variable in calculus, right? It's a, it's a variable that's there that allows us to plug in the limits, allows us to evaluate the antiderivative so we can plug in the limits of theta that are actually included there, theta 1 and theta 2. So my question is, do theta 1 and theta 2, are they different for my two shoes? Okay. Um, and this is, you know, not necessarily the easiest of questions. Uh, it, you know, it might be after we think through it a little bit, but it's, um, it says here we're going to assume symmetry, okay? That was one of the pieces of information we were given at the very beginning, assume symmetry. What that means is that we're assuming symmetry across this vertical line. If we're assuming symmetry across that vertical line, then it means that our angles from the pin to the shoe, right, are going to be the same on both sides as long as it's symmetric. Now, this, this uh, kind of hurts some people's brains a little bit because they might say, well, but the drum is turning counterclockwise here. And that means that we kind of, you know, mentally it's easy to think of the beginning of shoe one as being up here and the end of shoe one as being down here, whereas shoe two might be easy to think of it as the beginning right here and ending right here due to the direction the drum's turning. Don't do that mentally because we, Either way, whether we're talking about a shoe that is self-energized or one that is not self-energized, we still use the geometry of figure 16-7 over here, all right, to figure out theta 1 and theta 2. So just don't be tempted by that. It actually turns out, you know, relatively easy because of this. Okay, so what does this actually mean? What if I now take T1 over T2? OK, 
Okay, I could do something very similar to this for my second shoe, right? And if I did that, the exact same thing for my second shoe and I took T1 over T2, what am I left with? Okay, F is a constant between the two of them. B is constant, R is constant. This denominator of sine theta A was constant, was just one, and the integral is constant. It means this just ends up giving me a ratio between the pressure, the maximum pressure in shoe one and the maximum pressure in shoe two. Okay, <clears throat> well that can be a little bit helpful. Let me show you how, okay? Because at this point, we don't know much about how to get PA1 or PA2, but at least we know that if we can find uh, either those values or at least the ratio, that would help us with this question of how much torque would be carried in each shoe, okay? So here's where we need to go to the next phase of the question. Um, and this one utilizes uh, two equations that are in here. These equations are for MN and MF, okay? MN refers to the amount of moment that is generated around the pivot pin due to the normal forces in the shoe, okay? So that's the M is not referring to a moment for the entire break. It's literally referring to for one shoe, um, how much uh, of a moment is created around the pin uh, for this. And if you write out this equa equation, um, it tells you here that this is going to be F, which is friction factor times P sub A times B times R all over sine theta A integral uh, from theta one to theta two of, oh, I was looking at the wrong one. Let me fix this just by showing the other subscript. I was looking at the uh, M sub F. M sub F is actually the equation that we have for the frictional forces in the shoe rather than the normal forces. All right, so anyway, I'll continue with that one since I started it. Sine theta times R minus A cosine theta d theta. All right. This is, this expression right here is uh, equation 16.2. And you might notice here that uh, we still have uh, P sub A included in here, so that's a little bit encouraging. Let me do the one for the normal, since I started it a second ago. Uh, the normal component of, excuse me, this is again, this is the, the moment, I shouldn't say component of moment. This is the moment that is created around the, the pin for either of the brake shoes uh, due to the normal forces in the brake shoe. Okay, like where the brake shoe contacts the drum. All right, so this one ends up being P sub A, uh, B times R times A, okay? And that means that we need to remember what A is. Uh, I guess I had it in this other expression too. A is right here. A refers to how far is it from the center of the drum to the pin right, to the pin that we're summing these moments around. So that's what that variable means. This is going to be divided by uh, sine theta A, okay, integral from theta 1 to theta 2, okay, um, sine squared theta, d theta. Well, why do we care about the moments created around the pin? Okay, by the way, this is equation uh, 16.3. The reason we care about the moments created around the pin 
is this is where we finally get back to the question we are trying to answer, and that is how much force do we need to apply in order, you know, with the wheel cylinder in order to get this kind of braking torque that we wanted. Okay, so that equation comes from equation 16.4 um, is one of them. There's actually a second one that's given. It's 16.7. Okay, F is equal to uh, MN minus MF over C, okay? So we just came up with F, M, F and MN. Now what is C? Okay. C is basically, this is this distance right here. It's the distance from the pin to the point of actuation on the uh, brake shoe, okay? So that's that value right there. And this equation right here, again, this is equation uh, 16, 4. This is for the case of a self-energizing shoe. Okay. There's another one that's for the case of if you have a shoe that's self-de-energizing, all right? One that where you actually get a disadvantage due to, the, um, due to the direction of the rotation of the drum, okay? So the one for self-de-energizing is F is equal to uh, MN plus MF over C, okay? And this is this is equation 16.7. And you can see there, since MF uh, and MN are both going to be positive values, uh, you can see here that you are going to need uh, a larger amount of force uh, to get you know, similar values, since those are both going to be positive, because you have to add here versus subtracting there. All right, and again, over here, this is for self de-energizing. All right, now that I've presented all these equations, let's see if we can kind of map a, a path through what our solution needs to be so that we can, you know, if we just start punching numbers in, I think it might be a little bit tricky. What should a path look like to get through these equations and figure out F? Okay. So the first thing I'll say is because we have uh, this, you know, wheel cylinder, right? You, you might remember we have these wheel cylinders up here. The wheel cylinder contains one pressure inside of it, right? It's not two different pressures, it's one pressure inside of it, and typically the way they are built, they have the same amount of cross-sectional area for the pistons that ride in there. That is why, for the problem we're actually solving here, we can fairly easily presume that the force is gonna be the same pushing on the two shoes, okay? Well, since that force is the same pushing on the two shoes, it basically means that we can look at uh, you know, a set of equations like this, and we can say one of our shoes is self-energizing, one of our shoes is self-de-energizing, self de um, and we can imagine putting some subscripts on these equations. So F can be equal to, it's actually time now, which of our shoes is self-energizing versus which one is self-de-energizing? Yeah, shoe one is self-energizing. The reason why is the direction of, of torque here, 300 foot-pounds, is in a direction that it pushes the shoe toward the pin, right? Which is the direction that will tend to pull the shoe into contact with the drum, all right? So shoe one will be self-energizing, shoe two will be self-de-energizing. And so that tells me that down here, I can put subscripts on here and say MN1, MF1 over C, and here uh, MN2, MF2 over C. 
and then those can be equal to each other. Okay, well that's maybe helpful uh, to some level. Why? Okay, let's start working on it down here. Let's, we know that F equals F, right? The two F's that we have here are the same. Now what we can say is that uh, MN1 minus MF1 over C is equal to MN2 plus MF2 over C. And because we have that over C for both cases, we can just get rid of it. Okay, we just multiply through by C, and we end up with an expression like this. Okay, so now let me actually expand that expression uh, given the uh, functions that we just wrote for MN1 and MF1. Okay, so I wrote these, this, these two expressions up here. Uh, one of them was right here. Okay, so I'm basically saying that plus, or minus, excuse me, minus this With one little set of things I need to do, I need to say um, this is P sub A1 and this is P sub A1. Remember, all the other variables aren't going to change, okay? But P sub A isn't the same between uh, one shoe and the other shoe, okay? This is now going to be equal to the same expression but with a plus sign. So equals the same thing with a plus sign and with PA2 and PA2. Okay, well how does that help me? Okay. One thing you might see is that we have a lot of common factors between all the terms in the whole expression, right? So, you know, we already could get rid of sine, but I can get rid of them again, uh, even if it wasn't uh, equal to one. But what else can I do? Okay, I can get rid of my R's. I can get rid of my B's. Because it shows up in every single term. Okay, so far so good. Um, what if I now take this expression and I try to solve it for the ratio between PA1 and PA2? You might notice I've got PA1 all on the left side, right? So I could factor out a PA1, right? So essentially pull out a PA1. I could do that on the on the second uh, part of the equation down here and factor out a PA2. And once I did that, I could arrange those in a fraction and say here that PA1 over PA2 is going to be equal to uh, A, okay, I'll, you might see for that first um, you know, item up here, we have A is the only thing that's left over, uh, times the integral from theta 1 to theta 2 of sine squared theta d theta, okay, um, minus, in the second one, I still have an F left over, but now I have that multiplied by the integral from theta 1 to theta 2 
of uh, sine theta times r minus a cosine of theta d theta. All of this over Okay. In the denominator, I will have a times the integral from theta 1 to theta 2 of sine squared theta d theta <coughs> minus, I, this upper one, sorry, this one should have been plus. Down here I have minus. All right, now is that something we can work with? Okay, is there anything in there we don't know? All right, I would say it looks to me like there's really nothing in there that we don't know or that we at least can't find given the geometry of what we are dealing with. Once we find this, we've found the fraction between the maximum pressure for shoe one, maximum pressure for shoe two. We can take that and plug it into our relationship for torques that I had up here. And that relationship for torques gives us an extra piece of information that lets us know how much each shoe contributes to the overall torque. All right, so let's figure that out. Go back up here. Um, A was one of the factors that we needed. What is A for us? Okay. Okay, you would be tempted to say five inches. That's not uncommon for people to say five inches. It's not quite right. Okay, the reason it's not quite right is we do not have our pin uh, centered the way they have their pin. If you actually look at the pin that they have right here, um, that is where all of the angles begin. Right, and that's also a direct measurement center to that point. So for us, we would need to actually identify that axis as being right here. Okay, where this length, that is our, our value of A. All right. Well, so what is that value? Okay, square root of five inches squared plus one and a half inches squared. And if you compute this, it ends up being 5.22 inches. Okay, that direct measurement from the center to that, uh, to that pin. And so that's what we plug in for A down in this equation down here. Okay. A equal 5.22 inches. Okay, and everywhere there's an A, we plug that in. Then what? Where do we find F? Okay. We are given a little bit of information here. We're given what kind of material this is. It says the shoe is lining is rigid, molded, non-asbestos shoe lining material. All right. So we need to actually look that up, um, which, uh, let me see here. I think I have it. Page 854, table 16.3. 854, 16.3. It gives you several different types of materials here and some estimates that you can use for the friction coefficients. Okay. Uh, rigid molded asbestos. Okay. And, oh, sorry. Rigid molded non asbestos is what I'm looking for. It says the friction coefficient can range between 0.33 and 0.63. Whoa. That's a big range. 
right? That's one of the tricky things about doing designs with respect to items that have friction. It's not that easy to get that value super tight as to what it's going to be. So what do we typically do uh, whenever we're designing something? We say, uh, I'm trying to figure out here how much force would I need to apply. Probably the most interesting question is, what's the worst case scenario? What's the maximum force you might need to apply in order to get this amount of braking torque? So what value should I use to achieve that? The lowest one in the table, which gives you 0.33. Okay, so I'll put that right here. F is equal to 0.33. That is going to be based on, again, table 16.3 on page uh, 8. 54. Okay, good so far. What else? Okay, we do need to find some angles. Let me come back to that in just a second. Um, what about R? Okay, let's go back up to the picture again. Okay. The R that it's referring to there is the radius from the center to the inside of the drum, okay? That for us can be found with the idea that we have a 12 inch ID on our brake drum, okay? So our, our value is going to be what? Six inches. All right, so now we come to the ones that are a little bit more tricky for us to find, and that are the, the, these are the limits, limits of our brake shoe, the angles that define the limits of our brake shoe, theta one and theta two. Okay, so let's actually do that right up here on the figure. Remember, this orange line that I just drew, that is zero, all right? So how do I get an angle such as theta one? Theta one would be this angle right here. Okay, if I show it on here, this would be theta one. How do I get that? Okay. Well, I'll say that theta one is not going to be different than the theta one that I have over here, right? Where I basically go uh, from this pin over to here. The trouble is I have an angle offset from my vertical axis over to where the pin is. So that's something I probably need to find first. How do I figure that out? Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll call that theta p. Okay, theta p is the angle offset over to where the pin is located. What is theta p? Okay, yeah, so I, I know something about the triangle and I can use an inverse tangent. Okay, you can use an inverse tangent where I know that the rise is going to be uh, one and a half inches and the run is going to be equal to five inches. And this allows me to uh, state the theta p value there as being 16.7 degrees. Okay. Well, how does that help? Okay. Yeah, theta one is just going to be equal to, we'll, we'll kind of think of it as 180 degrees minus theta P minus what? Okay. 125 degrees. Why is it 125 degrees? That's what's left over up here. All right. So, Theta one ends up being, let's see, that ends up being 38.3 degrees. 
degrees. And what do you think that makes theta 2? Okay. Yeah, 138.3 degrees because we have 100 degrees spacing between the two of them. Okay, so does that give us some good ideas as far as what these limits are? All right, so once we know those limits, we can plug them in down here. All right, theta 1 is equal to uh, 38.3 degrees, and theta 2 is going to be 138 point three degrees okay now let me show you one uh, thing so that you know we can hopefully uh, help you out just a little bit these integrals aren't easy to do um, if you're just doing them by hand but you have a really nice piece of equipment that you're allowed to use on your exams and whatnot and I would like to show you that it's not a bad idea to learn how to use that for this purpose okay so let's do one example, okay, integral from uh, 38.3 degrees to 138.3 degrees of sine squared. I'll do it for this one, sine squared of theta d theta, okay? Here's the first thing I want to say about this. Don't do this in degree mode, all right? Even though we're working in degrees here, uh, from everything I can tell, uh, the calculator will mess it up if you leave it in degree mode. So first thing you want to do is go to setup and go to radian mode, okay? In radian mode, you can set up a, uh, an integral and do it for sine of theta, okay, for us we'll use the variable x because that's what it's expecting to see, right? And we're going to take that squared. When we, when we insert the limits now, we don't want to do this with respect to degrees, we want to do it with respect to radians. So we can put in 38.3 and do what else? Multiply by pi over 180 to convert that to radians. And up here, 138.3 uh, times pi over 180. Okay. And when I put these in, it ends up giving me a value of 1.3642. Okay. That is what I have, for instance, in this set of parentheses right here, 1.3642, as well as for right here, right? That's what is in those parentheses. Okay. <clears throat> you can do something similar um, for the, uh, the other part of this expression. Uh, and uh, when you do that, you get a, another number. I think I have it written up here. Um, 9.036, I think, is what comes out of the other one. Okay. All right. So... You get the point. I just wanted to give you one little hint on how to do these. It's a good idea, actually, to go ahead and calculate all of the integrals that you might need, you know, sort of up front so that you have those variables readily available. After punching that stuff in, let me do a little dot, dot, dot. You get a PA over, a PA1 over PA2 that is going to be equal to 2.44. OK. 
okay? And keep in mind, this is also the ratio between T1 and T2. Okay, tells you that the self-energizing shoe is going to be carrying more than double the amount of torque, or going to be responsible for uh, more than double the amount of torque that the uh, self-de-energizing shoe is going to have. So that's an interesting outcome all by itself. All right, well, now what do you do with that? Okay, remember... We kind of left off up here, T1 over T2 equals PA1 over PA2, okay? Well, now that I know this ratio, I should be able to solve and say, for instance, uh, T2 is going to be equal to what? Okay, kind of the other way around, right? T1 over 2.44. Okay. Now that I know that that ratio is 2.4, well, what can I do with that? I can bring it back up here and I can say uh, T1 plus T1 over 2.44 equals 300 foot pounds. Okay, so what is T1? Tell you what, I'm going to make this a little bit less messy here. Okay, when you solve this for T1, it ends up giving you, let's see. <clears throat> there it is. Uh, T1 ends up being 212.8 foot-pounds. And once you know that, you can divide it by 2.44, and that gives you that T2 Which is just 212.8 foot pounds over 2.44 tells you that T2 is going to be equal to 87.2 foot pounds. Well, how does that help us? What are we supposed to find? Okay, we're supposed to find the breaking force and we're still not there. But I wanna show you this though. Now that we know these two values, it's not actually that hard for us to plug in one of them into this expression that I had up here, equation 16.6. I can plug in now T1 into this expression. I know everything else, I can find PA1. How does that help? Okay, notice PA is also the only thing we don't know for MN and MF. What is, how does that help us? You can then plug it in for this value for F, all right? So we're actually on the home stretch here. All right, so we'll start with this 212.8 foot-pounds is going to be equal to F, which was 0.33, Okay, I'm working with this equation up here, which is equation 16.6, I believe, yep. So 0.33 times PA1 times B, B was that width in and out of the page, which is one inch. Uh, R is six inches. Okay. This is going to be divided by one, right, because we, we have a long shoe. Okay, and then we have an integral, again, from 38.3 degrees up to 138.3 degrees 
of sine of theta d theta. We haven't evaluated that one yet, but that one's not actually that hard to do. Um, even if you wanted to do it by hand, it's still not that hard to do. Or you can plug it into your calculator just like I did before. Uh, in case you're curious about what that value is, it ends up being 1.5314 just for that integral. Okay. But anyway, the other thing that we need to be careful with here is that I have the left side in foot pounds and I have the right side looks like in terms of uh, pounds and inches. So what does that mean I need to do on my left side probably? Okay, I probably need to multiply by a 12 inch per foot factor like this to get that into inches. And once I punch all of these in, P sub A1 comes out as, let's see here, 140.4 PSI. Okay, so that's, that's great because now I can start building my uh, MN and MF equations, right? So I start with MN equation 16.3. Okay, what it ends up being is 140.4 PSI. multiplied by B, which is that distance in and out of the page, multiplied by the radius, multiplied by the distance from the center of the drum to the pin, okay, factor C, or excuse me, A, I believe that was A. <coughs> yeah, A. So I'm working with this expression here. <clears throat> All right, I can divide by one if I want to for that sine um, theta a value, but I'll just leave it off. And then I multiply this by the integral from theta one to theta two of sine squared theta d theta. And when I punch all of this in, it ends up giving me an n sub n value that is equal to 5991.7 inch pounds. Okay. Basically the same concept, but a different equation to do the uh, moment induced due to the frictional forces in the shoe. That's the moment induced about the pin due to the frictional forces in the shoe. That comes from equation 16.2 up here. Okay, so equation 16.2 becomes um, 140.4. times the friction factor, times the uh, width of the shoe, times the radius, times the integral uh, from, again, 38.3 degrees to 138.3 degrees of sine theta times six inches minus 5.22 times the cosine of theta, 5.22 inches times the cosine of theta, d theta. Yep. Anytime you are going to try to use, if you're going to use your calculator to do these integrals, um, my recommendation is to not use degrees. My recommendation is to go into radians. I'll just say I've, I've played with these and where I feel like I have the settings to where they should be. Um, 
and try to work these integrals, it doesn't give me the right answer. So um, if when I get when I put everything into radians, it gives me the right answer. So I'll just say uh, I have not tried it a lot with the uh, TI, but I've done it with the Casio, and this is my recommendation. So if someone tries it with the TI and it works just fine, that's fine. But I would test it first before coming in here and just expecting that it will work. All right. So now punching in all of the values that we needed there, we end up with an MF uh, equal to, let's see, I have that right here, 25 11.3 inch pounds. Well, now that I have MN and MF, I should be able to punch those into uh, equation 16.4 because I did all of this for a self-energizing shoe, right? I did all of this for shoe number one, which we said was self-energizing, okay? So that means I get to use equation 16.4 and find F, okay? 5991.7 inch pounds minus 2511.3 inch pounds. Okay, all of this over C. And that, you know, if we, in case we forgot, uh, the C variable is the direct distance from the pin to the point of actuation from the, the wheel cylinder. Okay, and so that C value for us is how far? Probably some of you are a little gun shy because you thought you were clear on what the uh, value was going to be for A and we ended up being wrong. But for this one, it is, it is actually that easy. It is just 10 inches straight from the pin to the point of actuation. It's just 10 inches. Okay. And once we punch those values in, it ends up allowing me to find an F value of 348.6 pounds. Final answer. Okay. An interesting secondary question is, let's say you happen to know the diameter of the cylinder that's generating the pressure, right? Let's say, you know, you have a little cylinder um, where you have your hydraulic pressure and that's what's generating the force, right? So this is where your hydraulic pressure is. Okay. And, you know, this is kind of what generates a force that will actually actuate the thing. And let's say that I happen to know the diameter of this is one inch, just, just to make an easy number. How do I back solve from there and figure out how much hydraulic pressure I need in order to have this amount of brake actuation force? Okay. Yeah, so uh, P, for the hydraulic is going to be equal to 348.6 pounds over pi times one inch squared over four. Okay, not really that tricky. And this ends up being 442 PSI, which is not an unreasonable uh, that's not an unreasonable wheel cylinder size, right? You, could, you might have something that might be roughly that size. Maybe it might end up being a little smaller sometimes, but. All right, we have just a few minutes left. Let me ask you a question. Let's say you wanted a more effective brake. Let's say you wanted more braking force uh, for the amount of essentially leg effort that you have to put in as the driver. 
pushing on the master cylinder or on the pedal that connects to the master cylinder. Okay, what's a way that you could think of that might make this better? Okay. Yeah, what if you actually had both of your brake shoes set up so that they self-energize? Okay. Some of you have been to spring release where I have driven my Volkswagen truck. Have you ever been there and seen that Volkswagen truck? My front wheels of that vehicle have two self-energizing brake shoes. Why do you think that might be? Okay, back then, it was built in 1960. Back then, um, for actually for multiple reasons. One, the engine's in the back, and having vacuum in the front isn't necessarily an easy proposition. They didn't want to have any kind of, you know, brake assist back then. And so what they did is they, you know, allowed there to be two self-energizing shoes in the front wheels of that vehicle. Some of you may not realize that truck is actually a one-ton truck. It has a one metric ton uh, load capacity, which a lot of you might look at that kind of funny, but that was actually built to be a truck back in the day, right? So it actually has beefy brakes on it so that if you have a, a heavy load that you're carrying, it can manage it, and this is how they did it, okay? Um, in case you're interested in working this problem, um, what makes this problem a ton easier than the last one? Yeah, right? So T, actually T1 equal T2 because there's no difference between the two because you basically, you might see there's a little hydraulic line. Hydraulically, both of these cylinders are connected. So they're going to have the same amount of force in both cylinders, which means F is going to be the same on both of them and everything else is the same as well. So the two amounts of torque that you have in the two shoes are equal to each other. That makes that part really easy. And that we, that's where we spent most of our time was trying to figure out the apportionment between the two shoes, right? And so you do this, it makes a lot of this problem a lot easier. And in case you wanna work this exact problem on your own and come up with an answer, I'll give you what I got when I basically did the same problem but did two self-energizing shoes I wound up getting an actuation force necessary of 245.7 pounds. Okay, just by making that one change of flipping one shoe around. All right, so that is what I have for today. Any, uh, any questions? Yeah. Okay. Question was, can we go back over where the um, values came from for this angle? It's 180 degrees all the way from this line up here to this line down here. If you subtract 125, you get to here, right? If you subtract theta P, you get to here. And that's what leaves left over uh, theta one. Okay, so this right here is theta p. This is theta one. This is 125. So one way of looking at it is theta p plus theta one plus 125 equals 180. All right. I'll see you guys next time.